watching ABC's Wide World of Sports. and welcome to the historic Milwaukee Mile. The incident you just saw in last Saturday night's IRL race at Nashville has to rank among the all-time best saves in open-wheel racing history. Two cars colliding at almost 200 miles per hour and neither wrecked, but also neither won. And the anger and frustration in the post-race reignited the fuse on a few that began right here on this very racetrack four years ago. Let's turn back the clock to the year 2000. The Toyota Atlantic event. The leaders, Buddy Rice in the yellow car, Dan Mullen in the blue car. A battle out of turns three and four, then contact on the front straightaway, and Rice spins. Does this scenario sound familiar? Two very aggressive drivers work for the same piece of racetrack, neither willing to budge a single inch. And as expected afterwards, tempers flare. Not real smart, you know, we're already running 140 miles an hour, and he's deciding to bump wheels now again, so just pretty dumb move I think especially for two points leaders to be for him to be trying to do that when he's left 20 laps to go I mean just reckless four years ago it began last week it flared in rather spectacular fashion and today two drivers representing two of the power teams in open wheel racing will square off once again for points and for pride folks don't go away this rivalry is red hot Major sports rivalries are intense battles. Now a fierce new rivalry is heating up the Indy Racing League with the legacy of names like Andretti and Bobby Rahal. Two teams and six determined drivers. You gotta keep them separated. At the greatest spectacle in racing, Buddy Rice held off Tony Kanaan to score his first career victory. Two races later at the Bull Ring in Richmond, Dan Weldon charged to the finish line ahead of Vitor Mira. The rivalry intensified the following week when Andretti Green raced across the line in third behind the one-two photo finish of the Ray Hall Letterman drivers. It all came to a head last week in Nashville when the racing between Weldon and Rice went beyond side-by-side. Some people think that they uh, have the line everywhere and they can drive wherever they feel. We're going to bring the heat to that whole group right now. Do I look like I honestly give a <laughs> really about Buddy Rice? Come on. Between them, Mira and Rice dominated, leading 165 laps. But on the last lap, it was Tony Kanan who took the checkered flag. Kanan and Weldon now sit 1-2 atop the point standings with Rice in third. Today in Milwaukee, the rivalry continues. especially with regard to this track, the Milwaukee Mile. They've been racing at this track for over 100 years. It's the oldest track in the world. First race in 1903, but this is the IRL IndyCar Series first visit to Milwaukee, and they're bringing an amazing show. The ongoing battle between Ray Hall Letterman and Andretti Green Racing. It has been tough. It continues to be so, and Scott Goodyear, it seems to me like Andretti Green Racing is awfully hard to beat. Paul, they seem like they've got all the pieces of the puzzle, this team. They've got the cars, they've got the powerful Honda engines, and they certainly have the sea of engineers to make those cars go fast. And they also have a four to two team ratio with drivers against their biggest rival, Ray Hall Letterman. Ask any team earlier in the year if they thought four drivers could work on a team, and they said no way. Now, you ask the Andretti Green team guys, 
What makes you successful? They say Michael Andretti. Michael was fierce as a driver inside the car. Well, he's certainly doing that himself also outside the car. He's won here five times, Jack, and I would have to say, if you have to pick a team today that's going to win, I'm choosing Andretti Green. Well, it might be four against two, but the two that make up Ray Hall Letterman Racing, the most unlikeliest of candidates for a team that many people thought was going to be an afterthought this season. But they have come together under the tutelage of Bobby Ray Hall with Buddy Rice and Vitor Mira. Rice, the All-American, who just drove his way right in after being an unemployed race car driver to, well, we'd have to call it the first American champion since 1998. And then Vitor Mira, between the two of them, since Indy, they have either won every race or should have won every race, at least if you talk to them. They have combined a talent for take no prisoners as well as a we can't get no respect attitude to kind of become like that American rental car company that's second in the country, they try harder. Yeah, and Jack, speaking of Vitor Mira, he has the pole here, the second of his career. He's led 150 laps this season. That's the most laps of any driver who has not won a race. Let's go to Todd Harris. All right, thank you very much, Paul, here with Vitor Mira. Vitor, your first time here at Milwaukee. You grabbed the pole. Are you feeling the pressure? Uh, not at all. I mean, we, that's all about the teamwork, team centrics, and then the Ray Hall Edmund Racing. We know what to do. And uh, it's, I mean, it's just do whatever we've been uh, doing for the, since Indianapolis. So it's, it's uh, I won't say that it's, ne it's never easy, but we, we know what to do. Team Ray Hall Letterman, 709 pole event, and you've got a strong road racing background. Is that going to affect you today on what some are saying is a one-line track? Yeah, the bottom line is everything is racing. So uh, for sure the road race helps a little, but the bottom line, everything is racing and speed is the same. So uh, it's just get on it. Good luck and be safe. Thank you. From a man who's starting on the pole to a man who will not even be in the field today, let's check in with Dr. Jerry Punch. Thank you, Todd. That's reigning IRL IndyCar champion Scott Dixon, who will not race today. He has not been medically cleared because of a hard impact in qualifying in his second lap on Saturday. That impact sustained. Actually, he had two crashes yesterday on Saturday. The first one, a spin between turns one and two, and the second one, a very, very hard impact, destroying a car up in turns three and four on his second and final lap of qualifying. Now, he sustained a fracture at the base of his right thumb and a severe sprain to his left ankle. The thumb fracture is no problem. The ankle is the problem because he cannot push the clutch and break. He is a left foot breaker. And with a little help, Paul, possibly Dixon will be able to come back and race next Sunday at Michigan. There's Adrian Fernandez. When we come back, you'll meet the man they call the Mexican, the most experienced driver on the Milwaukee Mile of the starting field today. Over racing takes me out. They feel they can drive wherever they want. We're going to bring the heat to that whole group right now. The Milwaukee AJ Floyd Indy 225 on ABC Sports, brought to you by Chevy, the winningest name in racing, and American Revolution. Target, expect more, pay less. And Firestone. For more information on Firestone tires, visit your Firestone retailer. Welcome back to our Firestone pre-race show. I'm Paul Page. Can you imagine how the Secret Service must have felt when a 200 mile an hour IRL IndyCar pulled up the drive at the White House? Well, that's exactly what happened this last week as Buddy Rice and the entire crew of his Ray Hall Letterman team were honored by President Bush, the Indy 500 champion. But I'm not really sure uh, whether or not he was uh, going to end up with a ticket. Adrian Fernandez, by the way, was honored last fall by the president of Mexico, Vincente Fox. Now, when you meet the driver of that number five car, he will call you amigo, his friend, and he has many. Soy Adrián Fernández, el mexicano. He says, I am Adrián Fernández, the Mexican. In the racing world, he is the Mexican. And in his country, he is Michael Jordan, Lance Armstrong, and Tiger Woods wrapped into one. Fernández is a self-made man whose early racing ups and downs almost knocked him out of the sport. A starving artist of sorts who willed his career into existence. 
Every Christmas for so many years, I did not know what I was going to do the following year. For many, many years, many, many years, up to until I was 29, 30. Before that, it was a year by year. Year by year, race by race, Adrian proved himself a capable driver and an innovative businessman, making his own sponsorship deals and creating his own opportunities. All the while, adding skills to his arsenal and strengthening his resolve to succeed. Today, he is the most successful driver in Mexican history and an inspiration to his countrymen. When I wanted to drive, I didn't want, I would never think, I never thought about the money, I never thought about the fame. I didn't want to be, become famous or millionaire or, or, or this or the other. I wanted to become a successful race car driver because I, I loved it. Now, as an owner and a driver, Adrian still has a full plate. But at age 41, he allows himself time to savor the fruits of his labor. His toys include a Ferrari, which he proudly prowls around the streets of Phoenix, and a Learjet that gets him from race to race in style and a hurry. This is a Lear 31. And um, basically, I fly it everywhere I go. I do like 300 hours a year. Makes my life uh, more efficient, more balanced. Balancing time on the track and time on the links is no easy task. And Adrian sometimes forgets which is which. Seems like he's biting off more than he can chew. Throw in a couple hours to work on your short game and serve, and then quality time with friends at your favorite Scottsdale restaurant, and you're looking at one busy opera. With every start, rest assured, Adrian Fernandez is plotting a way to get to the front, just as he has been doing all his life. That's what I did all my life, is worry about myself, what I do best. And that's work, do my best, and dedicate, and concentrate, and focus on what I really want to do. And at the end of the day, that gets results. And today he'll start sixth in the number five car. He could be the spoiler in the middle of the points fight. Thanks a lot for joining us for the Firestone pre-race show. When we come back, it'll be green flag time on the Milwaukee Mile. Vito Veira, car number 17. Tony Canal, car number 11. Buddy Reich, car number 15. Sam Hornish Jr., car number 6. Elio Castroneves, car number 3. Adrian Fernandez, car number 5. Dario Franchitti, car number 27. Thomas Schechter, car number 4. Jock Lazier, car 20. Darren Manning, car number 10. Brian Herda, number 7. Townsend Bell, car number 2. Felipe Giacone, car number 24. Ed Carpenter, car number 52. Alex Barron, car number 51. Dan Weldon, car number 26. Mark Taylor, car number 13. Pura Dagarni, car number 12. AJ44, car number 14. Scott Sharp, car number 8. Kosuke Matsuda, car number 55. Dan Weldon had qualified 16th for this race, but the 26 car will start in the back of the field. They had to change an engine, and that requires the move to the back. Well, every time, as you mentioned, that it happens, drivers get a little nervous. He has to have a great race car to move forward, and he anticipates that he does. Remember, there's a different fuel strategy when you start at the back, and that might be what they do today to try to get front. Scott, let's not forget that a week ago, Vitor Mira had problems on starts, and when he's looking over to the side of his cockpit now, he doesn't see a teammate, he sees an opponent. Field is rolling toward the green flag on the Milwaukee Mile. Green flag, green flag. Mira takes a slight advantage over Kanan as they go into one. Rice slots into third place. Then the Penske team. Safely through turns one and two on the back stretch. Look at how Kanan makes the move. Whoa! And sweeps into the lead. Tony Kanan will lead the first lap of the 225. Mira's driving very defensively right now. Paul, I spoke to him just after this warm-up session this morning. Didn't seem as confident maybe as he did just last week. I think we're seeing the result of that right now. And the number six car of Sam Hornish moved into second place. Then Mira, and now his teammate Buddy Rice running a slightly lower line. Rice tries a move on Mira and gets 
gets away with it. It looked almost like Mira let him go. You were right, Jack. Well, and also Buddy Rice sees Tony Kanan pulling away and says, I can't wait any longer for my teammate. Thomas Schechter was up trying to worry Adrian Fernandez. Schechter has a new spotter today. Poncho Carter no longer topside. Buddy Engblom will be calling the shots instead. First time since Phoenix that Tony Kanan has led the first lap. And at least we forget he won that race. Schechter looks again to the inside. He may have him there. And Schechter moves forward. That gives him sixth. Now Dario Franchitti looks to the inside of Fernandez. Darren Manning behind Franchitti. Look how high Fernandez rides there. Multiple lines at this racetrack. There's one optimum line for qualifying for high speed, but this racetrack really lends itself to about two or three different lanes. Now, it really depends on how you like your race car to work. A lot of guys would like to run the low line, some guys high, but you have an opportunity here to maneuver your car around if it doesn't work very well for you. Let's keep you up to speed on what's happening to Dan Weldon. Started shotgun on the field. He's already moved up four spots, showing in the 17th spot. Next guy in his sights. Now, well, there he is, the yellow and red Delphi car of Scott Sharp. Yeah, but that will get Weldon the Klein Tools car only as far as where he qualified to start with. So it has been costly. You're now six laps in, and he's just getting to where he should have started. Scott Sharp has had a terrible weekend after really doing the open test here, Scott, and doing very, very well. He came here, and this team has just not been quick. Well, I found out why as we look at the Firestone telemetry. The car that they raced in the, in the practice session, in the open practice session, it's not the one they brought to the racetrack this weekend. I don't get it. Oh, Jack, either do I, because I'll tell you, anytime you find a nice car that runs real strong like they did here in the test, you keep that car ready to go for the next event. Yes, it's repeatable, but that's a very strange thing. Jerry Punt. Well, guys, you mentioned the engine change for Dan Weldon, and it certainly fixed the problems they had this morning in the final practice session. They had a misfire during that session. They found out it was a fuel pressure regulator problem. So they made an engine change, and although he had to start shotgun on the field, they told him to be patient. He is picking them off one by one. This team now very confident about what could happen for their operation here today. And he makes a move now on Sharp, and that takes him up yet another spot. Goes off the pace right now. Don't Mara drops back off the pole. Don't forget, Weldon has seen this movie in black and white. Remember at Richmond, he was he didn't qualify very well, and by the end of the night, using some good pit strategy, he beat everybody and was in victory lane. It's the inaugural IRL IndyCar Series event at the historic Milwaukee Mile, the Milwaukee A.J. Foyt Indy 225. Kanan is on point. Maybe he can stay there and further his points lead. Well, when we left you, we were wondering about Tony Kanan's ability to stay out front. And just a few laps ago, in fact, one lap ago, at this very point on the track, Sam Hornish got around Tony Kanan. Now watch this. Nice clean move that was set up in turns three and four. Paul got him going into turn one. Tony knows it's early in the race. He wasn't going to resist. He just let Sam go. Running at 153 miles an hour right now on the track by Sam Hornig. The biggest stars in Major League Soccer meet for one spectacular game. Landon Donovan leads the West against the East, featuring 15-year-old sensation Freddie Adu. The Sierra Mist MLS All-Star Game next Saturday live at 2, 11 Pacific here on ABC Sports Championship Television. Well, we're just past now the halfway point in the IndyCar Series season. And this is uh, how they've done in the past couple of years. And you see, Paul, 2003-2004, Tony Kanan, he has not forgotten the fact that in 2003 he led for the points for so very long but he didn't win a lot of races and that was why the win in Nashville a week ago and a win today is so very important to him and the Andretti Green Racing Team. From the fight for third place and it involves teammates that's Mira blue and white car number 17 moving to the inside looks like Buddy Rice. 
Rice is sitting uh, is sitting back now. There's Castro Neves, his three car. Just all getting around to Kage right now. What we're seeing right now, though, is that everybody's car is starting to change. The tire pressures come up, the tires start to get warm, the fuel is burning off. The key thing for drivers this weekend, I've heard from everybody I've spoken to, we have to have the car consistent. And that's the key word, consistent, for the full fuel run, which could be as many as 55 to 60 laps. When we were looking for Buddy Rice, he was up in this fight right behind Castro Neves until they all came up on tour at Takagi. One of the things that I'm noticing, fellas, is the way that they're passing. We saw that with Tony Kanaan and, and, and the, the, the pass by Sam Hornish Jr. They're giving an awful lot of room to these cars, not like we saw in Nashville a week ago, or not like we saw just a little bit earlier today with the Infinity Pro Race. And all these guys usually stand up to see what's going to happen in the first turn with those cars. And those guys all piled into the turn one, two wall. So these guys heard about that this morning in the driver's meeting from Brian Barnhart. Thomas Schechter, the highest place Chevrolet and ninth place Jerry Punch. And Paul, a problem brewing on the Penzoil Panther machine for Schechter. He's radioed that the car is jumping out of gear, out of fifth gear in the corners. It's happened now three, now make it four times, and they apparently are going to try to get one of the gearbox guys up here so they can look it over when they make a pit stop. Again, Schechter's problem is jumping out of fifth gear, and uh, he is losing valuable time on the racetrack. And the 20 car, Jacques Lazier, just ahead of him, came into the pits 10 laps ago on lap 15 and changed tires. They had a problem with the left rear going down, so they changed all four, and that dropped Jacques back to last place and two laps behind the race. Jacques Lazier, of course, the driver that replaced Al Unser Jr. in the cockpit of that car, and he told me, he said, the learning curve has been steep, but every week we've gotten closer and closer. Now Sam Hornish. Toyota Power in the lead closes on plenty of traffic in front of him. Koski Matsuro will be the first of the group. And Paul, that's what makes this track a lot of fun for drivers. It's one of the oldest tracks in the country, built in 1903. But I'll tell you something, they love it just because it's a real driver's track. Tony Kanan in second place has actually dropped back almost a full second as the leaders begin to encounter traffic on the Milwaukee Mile. We'll be back after this message and a word from our ABC station. And don't forget when the race is done here today, ESPN.com is where you can chat with the winner. To send your questions or view that post-race chat, log on to ESPN.com keyword motorsports. The three car, Elio Castroneves, moved into second place behind Sam Hornish Jr., so it's Penske running one, two. We'll show you how that happened. They were actually running in quite a bit of traffic at the time. There he is, moved down on the inside of Mira. And that's Kanan just ahead of him. Now watch this. Watch how fast he comes up on Kanan. Goodbye. When was the last time we saw the two Marlboro Team Penske cars running one, two? Remember, they've got the Toyota power Miami. plants, and they've been behind the curve. Honda's dominated ever since post Miami, right straight through, Scott. And one of the key things, though, Jack, is that this is not a horsepower track. This is a handling track. The car has to work through the turns. You spend a lot of time going around through the turns in this one mile racetrack. The straights are just somewhere around 1,200 feet long. So when you think about Caution. it, turning is at a premium. Caution light, we got a spin off of four, and it's Scott Sharp. We were showing you Thomas Schechter because he came in with a gearbox You're problem. Right. And they were going to work on the gearbox, and then suddenly caution came on Scott Sharp. He wants to get going again, though. He certainly does. He just went down a lap from the two Marlboro cars, but you hear him say on the radio, it just snapped around on him coming out of turn four. Jerry Punch, what's going on with Thomas Schechter? Paul, oh, we told you that was jumping out of gear in fifth gear and revving the engine in the uh, corners. And he said a moment ago the temperature in the gearbox was just going up and it would not survive past lap 100. So they had no choice but to pit the Penzoil Panther machine and make a total gearbox change, which is exactly what's happening here. They get a break because the yellow, that means they will, they will uh, lose fewer laps on the racetrack. And that's some seriously hot work there. And what you see the guy doing in the blue right there is he's scooping some stuff out of the gearbox. That probably tells you that a gear broke because he's actually cleaning it out before they can put the replacement back in. 
Well, under this question, Scott, too, we, we've seen, we're going to go back and, and look at the Scott Sharp spin. Right in the middle of the turn, actually start to accelerate on the way out. Tells you that his race car is very loose. That means the back end wants to come around on you, almost like driving an ice. He could not get on the throttle, Paul. Now, we've actually seen a couple of cars do that this weekend, including Scott Dixon in the same place. Well, it's a very tricky track, Paul. There is no banking here. It's just really only about nine degrees. Turns one and two are very different from three and four. All weekend, I spoke to the guys. They say turns one and two, car works great. Three and four, very different, very difficult. And there is a headwind going into turn three which makes the car what they call positive, making the back end want to swap around. But, Scott, the bottom line is that Kelly Racing is underperformed since the drop of the green flag in Homestead. It's a big disappointment. Looks like the pits are open or about to open, and these will be the two cars that will be coming down. And from the looks of the pits, uh, most, if not all, of the field is going to come in. Mira, Rice, Matsura, they're all lined up, ready to head on to the pit road. One more turn ahead of that, and then... It's going to be very busy. The longest moment in the race for a driver when they're in the pits. Let's go to Todd Harris. Coming in, guys. Coming in. Well, they're talking about for Castro Nevis, absolutely light. no changes. They like the way the car's running. He'll come in. He'll get four new tires and Five, fuel and send him back out. Four, three, two, one, in. And Vitor Mira on pit road. They're not going to make a chassis change, but the reason he was backsliding in the field is because the tire pressures were too low. They had not come up. They have upped the tire pressure on all four tires. Let's go back to Todd. Him, but it was very close. They exited pit row, almost coming together with another driver. Uh, you know, there's going to be an interesting conversation within the Penske team. That was brilliant work there. Castro Nevis gets out ahead of Tony Kanan. Tony Kanan had better track position being right at pit exit, but Castro Nevis roared out of those pits and into the lead of this race. Sam Hornish came out. It looked to be almost as far back as fourth place uh, as they sort out crossing the line with a score. And we'll check that for you. But for the moment, Elio Castro Nevis looks like Hornish is going to be in third. Welcome back to the Milwaukee Mile. A.J. Foyt the fourth. They were just getting ready to go back to green flag racing. And the uh, green came out and then he got himself in trouble at the race that is uh, named to honor his grandfather. It's the Milwaukee A.J. Foyt Indy 225. I'm Paul Page, Scott Goodyear, Jack Arrud up in the booth. Down on the pits, it's Todd Harris and Jerry Punch. And we're back under the uh, caution flag again. They got maybe 12 seconds of green flag before this happened. You see here on the restart, the green car on your right-hand side is Foyt the fourth, trying to get on the power. And sir slides through there. Some great driving from him. Remember, after a pit stop, the tires are cold. You try to get on the power, and sometimes that back end can come around on you. Boy, Koski Matsura was Matsura was just really lucky on that one. This is uh, not the only incident that Anthony has had this weekend. And I spoke to him about this incident, and he said, you know something? Second lap of practice was just cold tires. I wasn't patient enough. Well, maybe that applies here as well. So we mentioned that uh, it was uh, Castro Nevis that came out first out of the stops, followed by Kanan uh, and then Sam Hornish. But Brian Herta. Uh, once again, Andretti Green Racing splitting back and forth. Herta stayed on the track. He's got a lot longer time since his last pit stop, but the strategy is split. Jerry Punch. Hey, guys, we told you that uh, Thomas Schechter was having some gearbox complaints, and Thomas is climbing out of the car. Was that what it was, Thomas? The gearbox went away? Yeah, it was the fourth, fifth gear, and that's when, you know, we had such a good car. We were really moving forward, and then you could see me dropping back. It, it kept on hitting neutral every time I was going into the corner, so the car would get really loose going in, and then I would get on, and it would rev right up, and then it would hit the gear again. So uh, it's unfortunate for everybody. E each time we seem like, like we've got a really good car, and uh, it's a great driver's track. We, we seem to end up with something wrong, and we've got to work at this. We've got to sort it out, and uh, I don't know. Maybe I've got to start throwing some, some bones and, uh, on the floor and see, see what it comes up with. Try another... Try something else. I don't know what to try. I've tried all my tricks and nothing's worked, so we'll see. 
Nothing but bad luck for the Pins All Panther team. Guys. Yeah, no luck at all this year. No, and a tough day today for Thomas Schechter. His mom had flown in and it was here and actually voted for Thomas out on the midway as most popular driver in the ongoing balloting. So his mom came here to watch him race today. Well, short day for Thomas Schechter. The only car out, Brian Herta, the XM satellite radio car, out in front. And boy, this is AGR. They're playing it again. That's that unfair. Four against two guys. But I'm going to give you three names that Brian Herta gave me earlier today. You know, he funds and sponsors a thing called the Snap on Stars of Karting. He's given me three names of guys that he wants us to watch 10 years from now running in the Indianapolis 500. Alex Speed, Alan Shudo, and Ron White. They're all under the age of 15, and they're all stars of karting. And they're going to be running Indy cars, according to Brian Herta, within the next 10 years. Darren Matting, Scott Goodyear up in the booth, just checking in with you. How's the track doing out there today? Yeah, pretty good. We're about to go green here, Scotty, so I'll have to leave you. I think we're... Good luck. I think we got one more lap here, one more lap, uh, Darren. Well, in fact, they are going to give him the green, and they have. Look at Kanan coming back at Elio Castroneves. That's Herta up front. Whee! Okay, outside, clear behind. That was Koski Matura that was down on the inside. And now Mira. And Mira just blows by Manning. And into eighth place. This is Frankiti, currently sixth. We did not come up to speed very well on that restart. Seemed to get passed by a couple of guys, but now he seems like he's picking his speed back up again. Remember, cold tires, you want to make sure you don't have any problems. And after watching Foyt on that last restart, that was probably the best move by Frankiti. Start keeping score, guys, though, on your leader, Brian Herter. Remember, he is not pitted. We say the pit window's about 65, maybe 70 laps with the cautions that we've had. So he's sitting with the fuse lit. He's got to get a caution, or this lead is going to be short-lived for him. His speed has been about 155 and a half miles an hour. That's substantially slower than everybody right behind him. They've been running 157s, 158s, and 159s. You can see Castro Nevis starting to take a look at different lines here, as I mentioned. Two or three different places you can go in and try to pass. The guy in front always likes to enter in high because the apex is all the way around the corner. And in the end result, if you can get a good drive coming off the turn, that's when you get your speed to draft that short little straight going into the next turn. That's what Castro Nevis is trying to accomplish right now. That's a battle for the lead. Pretty good fight going on just behind this battle as well. Tony Kanan and Sam Horning. So the other part of the uh, Andretti Green Racing Penske battle going. Paul, we're riding on board with Townsend Bell, and directly in front of him is Dan Weldon. And this is a battle for the 11th spot. Now, it looks to me, let's go back and look at it. Bell wants to get around, and all of a sudden he gets blocked. And, well, there's the salute. What's going on? Dan Weldon again involved in maybe some defensive driving? Well, what happens, you and your spotter's telling you, Jack, exactly where the guy is from behind you. It's pretty easy just to let the wheel go and make your car a little wider than maybe yeah, it should wider. be. Maybe they ought to just take mirrors off these cars. <laughs> so this battle for 11th place, as we look at the Firestone telemetry on Townsend Bell. Weldon just up the road. Comparison to a power plant. Weldon has a Honda, Bell a Chevrolet. You know what I find interesting with this racetrack, and well, he's flexing his hand there, Townsend Bell, he wasn't saluting anybody, is Scott, the short period of time you're at maximum G's, even as big as these corners are. Yeah, 4.3, 4.5 G's usually they're seeing, but I'll tell you something, you are turning a long time. Very crucial this racetrack to get the entry just about perfect. Hornish goes after Tony Kanan and grabs third. That was a battle that's actually been going on for a couple of laps. Hornish was setting it up there. There's Frankiti on Tony Kanan, the teammates. Left corner. Left corner. Inside. behind. Inside. Is that neat? I love that shot. And so Frankiti takes over fourth place. 
It's Herta, Castro Nevis, Hornish Jr., Frankiti, and Kanan. You would think that Herta is very close to having to make his first stop of this 225 mile race. Currently, he's the leader. and Sam Hornish Jr. have been trying to push Brian Herta, the leader, to run a little bit faster, though on the last straightaway, both of them dropped back a bit. Herta may have gotten some advantage. He is starting to move through traffic. Penske car, Jerry Punch. Guys, Brian Herta's team manager, George Cloat, said before the race today, we are going to take some chances and roll the dice in order to get a win. We've got to be one of these Andretti Green teams that gets a victory. Well, that means either short pitting or not pitting. He has not pitted yet. And just talking with George a moment ago, he says because of the yellow flags, we can go to around lap 80 to 82. But around lap 80, it's going to get very dicey on fuel pressure. So 11, 12 laps away. First stop of the race for Brian Herta, the current leader. Remember, Brian Herta was a guy that was offered that Buddy Rice ride when first uh, the injury happened to the guy that was going to drive for Kenny Breck, and he decided not to, and he didn't have the offer yet from Michael Andretti. That came after he turned down the replacement ride for Ray Hall Letterman Racing that Buddy Rice took. Well, but part of what figured him into this ride, see the 27, that red, white, and blue car back there, primarily blue? Well, he replaced Dario Franchitti after he was in a motorcycle accident a year ago and won at Kansas City. Now, there's the guy, Franchitti. Dario Franchitti right now, as bad as Brian Herta needs to win a race, I would dare say that Dario Franchitti needs to win one even more so for Andretti Green. You know, out of all the guys that start here today, there's 10 that have not started an IndyCar race here at Milwaukee. Well, Franchitti has started six times with the best finish of fourth. I got to believe, starting here many times myself, Patience plays off and gives you a lot of time to understand what you have to do with your race car and make the changes on it so it's good for a full stop. I would say without a doubt, all the patients are going to pay off for this guy here today. Well, and he's got his lucky charm with him this weekend because his lovely wife, Ashley Judd, has flown back from her movie location. And, uh, you know, he told us down in Texas that he tried out a special helicopter down there. And he said, I'm going to need to win a lot of races and the championship if I want to put a down payment on that super fast helicopter he likes. Well, he needs that. He flies his helicopter in a lot of close-in races. But now, you know, be able to get over the Rockies and go to Fontana or something like that, you're going to need some helicopters. Well, you can just hear the clock ticking on Brian Herta. I just wouldn't want to be in the cockpit knowing that time's running out. I mean, 75 laps completed. He can maybe go, what, Scott, to 80, 85? Well, that's what they're saying. But what he's hoping for right now, Jack, is a yellow caution period so he doesn't have to come in underneath the green scenario where he's going to end up lose, losing a lap or two because of this high-speed race pace. Probably eight or nine laps away now for Brian Herta's stop. Uh, Koski Matsura might be an indicator as well because he should be in in about the same lap. Look at Darren Manning down on the inside. He's been locked back and forth with Fernandez and Mira. We'll ride with him. Well, you know what happened back there was Takagi is a little bit off the pace, and you can see how wide this racetrack is. Interesting now, watch the hands here from the driver, just watch him using the gear shifter like he did right there on the right-hand side. With traffic, you'll go up and down the gearbox probably one or two times per lap. You want to have that low gear to get the drive off the turn, and then maybe up a gear to get the high speed going into the turn if you can actually make the pass. Scott, I really thought that Darren Manning was going to back off just a bit because he didn't have his teammate running in this race. And with Target being so close by here, maybe Chip Ganassi would say to him, hey, look, just make sure that you bring it home in one piece. But so far, that's not the case. Danger Mouse is at full song yet again. Yeah, look at this. This is earlier. That Merrick. Hi, how you doing? And now I'll just go after Fernandez. So Darren Manning continues to be on the prowl behind Adrian Fernandez. Ongoing battle for seventh place. Looks to the inside again, then drifts back. 
Vitor Mira is just back of this battle. There you get a glimpse of him. The pole sitter currently runs in ninth place. Well, you can see tempers are starting to fly just a little bit. See Adrian Fernandez wave his hand. Having trouble working this tight racetrack, getting around race traffic, and he's having a great deal, deal of difficulty with this Red Bull car. Gets by him now in turn one, and uh, hey, you know, you wish you could do more than just shake your fist at your fellow driver when you're, well, when you're actually, held up like what that. What he's doing down the front stretch is you always wave your fist at the starter just to give him a little notification, hoping he will put the blue flag out to the car that you're trying to pass. They're laid out now for Brian Herta. He should be stopping next time around. Only team that is laid out. Kind of wondered about what Matsuro would do. There he goes. So Brian Herta on the uh, fairly narrow entrance to the pit road and his team waits. And Paul, 81 laps for Brian Herta on that stop. They were down to less than half a gallon on their fuel consumption. They had to pit that time by. Casper Navis in turn three. Herta is down. No adjustments at pit stop on lap 81. And here comes the Marlboro team Pitsky car down the straightaway as Herta exits pit road. You know what? It's going to be a little closer than I would actually have expected as Herta comes up to speed. And Castro Nevis and Hornish go by, but that was a good pit stop. They got him in and out pretty quickly. Great pit stop, but that slowing down speed. Dario here, moves Dario. on Hornish, big time. And so Dario to second place. Tori Takagi, again, a, a factor in this 12 car. Tora has just not been on his game since his accident in Motegi, Japan earlier this year. Buddy Rice now closes on Hornet. The 15 car, the Indy champion. I think Rice senses there's some blood in the water. He's been following Sam Hornish Jr. long enough, and it looks to me, Scott, as if Hornish has got a bit of a push, and Rice says, well, that'll be an opportunity for me maybe to get that spot. So Elio Castroneves is now leading the sixth time this year. We'll be back after this message and a word from our ABC station. The Milwaukee A.J. Foyt Indy 225 on ABC Sports brought to you by the all-new Toyota Tundra Double Cab. Not just big, life-size. Delphi, driving tomorrow's technology. And Firestone. For more information on Firestone tires, visit your Firestone retailer. Welcome back to Milwaukee in the Milwaukee Mile, the AJ Foyt Indy 225. It's been a big week for your leader, Elio Castro Nevis. The best news he got this week was the trade that his agent, Perry George, pulled off for another client of his, Shaquille O'Neal. I asked Elio what his first purchase was going to be. He said, courtside seats for the Miami Heat. Your leader, Elio Castro Nevis, making a big purchase. Nevis, Franchitti, Rice, Hornet Jr., and Canaan. You know, ABC Sports has uh, full coverage leading up to the end of the season with the exception of the race at Fontana. Next week, one of the best in the series at Michigan. Reigning Indy 500 champ, there he is. Buddy Rice, points leader Tony Canaan, and the two-time winner of the Indy 500, Elio Castroneves, will head the field at the Michigan 400. That comes up next Sunday at 3 noon Pacific on ABC Sports Championship Television. Paul, 96 laps just went by with Castroneves leading, and because this is the 96th race IRL event that Firestone has been involved with, he gets a check for leading the 96th lap of $10,000. As good as that is, Scott, right now, what, what Elio Castroneves wants to do is convert that at a couple of zeros. He wants a win. Hard to believe that this two-time winner of the Indy 500 has not won at all in 2004. It's been some time in 2003. You know, Jack, it was interesting this morning because after the driver's meeting when I was talking to him, he went over there and he started to look at this beautiful glass trophy that he'll get awarded if he wins today. Then he put his hands on it and he started to rub it. And I said, aren't you superstitious? And he said, oh, man, I like this trophy. I want this trophy. He might just get it today. Coming into this race, he had very few moments at the front of the field, only 15 laps. On board with Darren Manning now. Continues to work Fernandez hard. 
Jacques Lazier, the 20 car, but Lazier is down four laps owing to his early stop. Tor Takagi, they called him in and uh, changed everything all around on the car. He continues to struggle with what appears to be an ill handling machine. I've been asking all the drivers quick questions, you know, choose one or the other, and I've asked some, all of them, sane or insane the way you drive? Believe it or not, well, I believe it. Darren Manning didn't even pause a beat. He goes, absolutely insane. For a guy that holds the world's record for driving backwards at over 100 miles an hour, I can see that one. Proof in the pudding right there. 100 laps complete. 225 laps the scheduled distance. They've been running laps 155 miles an hour. There's the guy that we nicknamed the Danger Mouse. Well, they actually used to have Danger Mouse, the logo from the cartoon, cartoon, actually embroidered on his driving suit. And then, well, Chip Ganassi didn't think that that was apropos. Back and forth. Battle for sixth. And here you see the difference in the lines with Fernandez taking the high line, trying to go into the turn, trying to clip off that apex, and Manning working lower on the low side of the racetrack. Now, in turns three and four, it is a little bit rougher down there on the lower side. But that new blacktop, they say, might give you a little bit more grip, a little bit more advantage going around the turn. But here you have to wait for the driver ahead to make a mistake and then pounce on him. Show you how powerful, speaking of Ganassi, that Ganassi is. He can change your name for you. When uh, Montoya came to race in the, for the Ganassi team, there is Taylor in, in the pits right now, the 13 car owned by Greg Ray. He, he decreed that it would be Juan Montoya, not Juan Pablo Montoya, and that was the way it was. Here we've been watching Manning gets a better drive off of turns three and four, the turns that we're headed to right now. Remember, only nine degree banking here at this racetrack versus the 15, 18, 24 we see in these big high bank tracks. He gets a bit better drive coming off of three and four, but cannot get the pass done getting down into turn one. But you know what, Scott? He's not afraid to go right down to that yellow line, and that's more than just a line, as you and I discovered this morning. That's a ripple strip. You put that left rear, to left front tire out of that ripple strip, you're in a whole heap of trouble. Here we go again. Manning gets down on the inside of Fernandez, and he's got him. So Manning picks up six. Oh, oh look at Franchitti. Now remember, Franchitti just grabs the lead in traffic. Whoa, boy. Yeah, and the reason that happened is Mark Taylor just came out of the pits from having service work done. And Castroneves gets pushed high into the marbles, all that tire rubber that's on the high line. Better thing for him to do is to get out of it and regain speed later. Got a view of the currently fourth place Hornet. We may be getting a report from observers on the track that uh, there may be a problem with Castro Nevis's motor. But it also could have been that he just backed out of the throttle so yeah. much because he had an accident they just forgot to tell him. And the 13 car coming up, Mark Taylor coming off of being in the pits. A lot of other traffic right there. Backpedaling was a smart thing to do. But it changes the complexion at the front of the field. It now Frankiti Rice, Castro Nevis to third. His teammate just behind him, Sam Hornish Jr. And then Tony Kanan. There's your interval. It goes from third place back to fourth. That's Hornish. Back up at the front. Now Buddy Rice is beginning to work on Frankiti. This is for the lead, and there's traffic just ahead of them. And once again, you remember when we started, we talked about Andretti Green Racing, AGR versus Ray Hall Letterman. There's that battle for you. Yeah, but Buddy Rice right now is saying, yeah, but it's blue and white. It's not red and white. It's Frankiti, not Weldon. Let me put my nose down on the inside and see if I can scare him. Frankiti, I don't think so. I don't think you can intimidate him. You aren't going to intimidate Buddy Rice. Well, that's for sure. Little word to Buddy Rice about what the traffic is ahead of him and why. And one of those cars that's the traffic ahead of him is the red and white Jim Beam flying tools car of Dan Weldon. 
So when he looks in the mirrors, you can rest assured that he'll let his teammate Yellow. go through. Cautions come out. And we're waiting for the report. No in indication of an accident. Sounds like debris, and the guy that lucked out on that was Weldon because he yeah. was just about ready to be lapped and be put down on one lap at race pace, so he's a lucky guy today. And uh, it's an absolutely perfect time for pit stops for all of the field. With all due respect, Scott, I think Buddy Rice is a lucky guy, too, because <laughs> he didn't have to get around Weldon again. It's going to be confrontational. I can't wait to see it. So as soon as they get Johnny Rutherford and the pace car out on the track and the field gathered up, they'll open the pits. And as we look up and down, with the exception of uh, perhaps Takagi and Felipe Giafoni, it looks like everyone else is probably ready to come in. See the flag being waved up there at the pit entrance. That, of course, tells you the pits are still closed. But now as they cross the line in the Chevrolet pace truck, they're beginning to get the field in tow. And, of course, they tell the field on the radio right now and of course in every driver's meeting close up just as fast as you can so we can get into the pits quickly. The only car that I don't think you will see Paul come onto pit road will be Brian Hurd. He is out of sequence. Most likely if I was his crew chief or a strategist right now I'd say let's stay out of sequence. Let's get our lap back as soon as possible and get back in the hunt. Takagi moving very slowly. He was in the pits a short while ago. He's been off the pace for quite some time. The race pace has been around 155, 158 miles an hour. He was doing laps of 130 to 135. Yeah, my note show him is in just 17 laps ago. Now, we saw a little smoke coming out of the air box there when he's sitting stationary, so it tells you maybe something with an engine. Jerry Punch. Guys, regular pit stops under the yellow. Dario Franchitti said, don't change a thing. I love the car. It's perfect. Just fill it up with fuel and slap four fresh Firestones on. Now, then in Buddy Rice's pit, Buddy's had a problem in the car and once the fuel burns off it gets better and better let's check in with Todd well Doc push this definitely the situation down here Sam Hornick was complaining that he was fighting a push both Penske drivers came in Elio Castro Nevis took on the four tires a little right wing a little front wing excuse me and the same for Sam Hornish front wing for both drivers but despite all that it's Frankiti that came out leading the pack followed by the two Penske cars and here's one of the reasons why I believe, Paul, Cornish and Castro Nevis are pitted right up there towards pit exit along with Tony Kanaan. Why? Because your pit positions are based upon the way you finished in the last race. That crash by Buddy Rice late in the race in Nashville has put him almost directly across the start finish line way, way back. Now this time it was Hornish that got out ahead of uh, his teammate, Elio Castro Nevis, but they both came out behind Dario Franchitti 115 laps into the race the yellow came out because Tora Takagi had a problem with his machine. <laughs> Consider the possibilities four of the longest hitters in golf two teams and one very special night. The Lincoln Financial Battle at the Bridges. One week from tomorrow, Monday night, August 2nd, live at 8, 5 Pacific on ABC, plus early coverage on ESPN2. You're riding with Darren Manning, the uh, sole team car now for this man, Chip Ganassi, the target Chip Ganassi racing team. Normally, Scott Dixon, of course, would be at the helm of the number one car, but uh, not today. He had two, not just one, two different accidents. And as a result, uh, elected not to run. The medical, uh, probably the best reason not to. That was the first. And then this one was really tore up a race car. As a result of those two, Scott Dixon going to spectate and head home. Last week at Nashville, though, we were able to follow this man uh, in the very, very confidential moments and with a wireless mic, Chip Ganassi. All right, you guys ready for tonight? Yes, we are. Yeah, we are. Nothing yeah. fancy on the pit stops now. Nothing fancy. Nice and easy, right? Go all night. Go all night. Run all night. Green flag is out, and they're started in the Firestone Indy 200. We just got word from Chip Ganassi himself. He said Scott Dixon is reporting he has no clutch. All right, he's, he's got no clutch. 
He's going to have to come in. You cannot put the starter over the wall. Get our seat out of the way. Pushing our car. All right, Scott, we still got a shot at this thing. I mean, it's going to take some it's going to take some luck on our part, but we can still do it. You got to stop when you can, even if you go down a lap or two, and hope that you get enough. If you stay out, you will. Yeah, 10 forward. It appears from here, anybody who gets up high drops to the back and doesn't recover. All right, no time. Tires. Up on time, front wing, no tires. Well, guys, we were at Chip Ganassi decided to take a big gamble. There was Scott Dixon. They didn't change any tires on that last stop. So you didn't change them, huh? No. Making us all sweat. We're racing, man. We're here yeah, to no. race. You'll be fine. All right. Hey man, great job. This is the first year that Chip Ganassi is actually calling the strategy for Scott Dixon, and Scott Dixon reminds him of it all the time. They just came back to green flag racing there on the back stretch after the restart. Frank Heaty led them off. And you ride with Manning. Manning currently sits in sixth place. There is Frank Heaty, the blue and white car, followed by the two Penske cars. The six of Sam Hornish, the three of Elio Castroneves, then Buddy Rice and Tony Kanaan. There's Rice. The 11 is Kanaan, current points leader in the IRL IndyCar Series. As we ride along here, watch the driver's hands, especially the right one. He'll be changing gears as he goes, as we mentioned, coming out of the turn, needing the lower gear, shifting up two gear changes for Tony Kanaan, which is very very strange, and the two going down to the turn. You know, it seems that recently, Scott, we've had more problems with gearboxes. Thomas Schechter had one today. And we haven't seen this much shifting, especially on the shorter tracks. Is there a combination there that makes a difference? Drivers and teams are always looking for optimum speed, and they start to find out now that they can actually use a lower gear coming out of the turn and then switch up going down the straight. Maybe they pick up a tenth. Any time that you can find on the racetrack is valuable, and these guys will do it every lap if they have to. There's Brian Hurd in that black, yellow, and red car. He is currently in the 12th spot. Fellas, remember I told you he wasn't going to pit. He didn't, so he's back off kilter again. It could turn out to his advantage, though, because he did get the move all the way around to the back of the field. He's just got to stay from being a lap down. He's still being shown a lap down. He can get it one, get it back. Yeah, he's actually 10 seconds back from the leader on the lead lap. There are Townsend Bell, the two car. And Paul, this Townsend Bell is having a heck of a day. Back at the restart here, Townsend Bell, he's had everything happen to him. Watch this. It's down, almost on the ripple strip. Well, oh, drivers oh. call that a moment. That, that's I a good think. moment. And that red and white car again, that's Dan Weldon. He seems to be in, in right glued to Townsend Bell all day. Maybe now Townsend Bell's going to be mad at Dan Weldon. Bell passed Weldon on the last lap. Now is lining up behind Mira, the 17 car right there. And there he is. Frankini is the leader. Then the two Penske cars looking better than they have looked, well, really, since Miami. Toyota's, Honda, Toyota, Toyota. Toyota's found a little bit of horsepower over the last couple of weeks. The big race next week at Michigan, a home race for Chevrolet. They tested there just a couple of weeks ago. Say they have some improvements for the Chevrolet power cars for that event. I love that racetrack. Fast racetrack, great racing. Yeah, what I love right now as we ride on board with the target car for Danger Mouse, Darren Manning, is the fact that Manning is going to try and take this spot away from Tony Kanaan. Manning doesn't have anything to lose. Tony Kanaan has got the championship right now by, what, 61 points? He's got to be looking in his mirror and saying, oh, no, I wish it wasn't Darren. <laughs> Manning to the inside. Kanaan stays right there. There's no letting him go. Just that little bit of movement forward with Kanan as Manning goes underneath. Might just be that advantage the Honda has going down the straightaway over the Toyota. Good ride for Manning. He now moves to fifth place.
Mike Cole told me the crew chief, or the t team manager for Target Chip Ganassi told me early in the week, Scott, that they did a breakdown of the speeds, the trap speeds around this racetrack. And for Scott Dixon and Darren Manning going out of turn two, they were four to six miles an hour faster than the Honda cars. But by the time they got to turn three, they were two miles an hour slower. I think that tells you the difference in terms of horsepower and straight line speed between the two engine mates. We've talked about it many times this year. Last year, it was all Toyota with Penske and also with Ganassi. This year, it seems to be all Honda with either Ray Hall Letterman or else Andretti Green Racing. Average speed of the race just over 130 miles an hour. We could use him to help us on the mileage if you could follow him right behind him. So good information from the pitch to Manning. Get up behind Rice. They're talking about fuel mileage. What he wants to do is get him up in the draft of Rice's car so his engine doesn't have to work as hard, save some fuel mileage, and stretch that fuel window maybe just a couple more laps. At the 136 lap right now, as you ride with the 10 target chip Ganassi car of Manning. The eight car is Scott Sharp, and he is about to be overhauled by Dario Franchitti, the leader of the race. Sharp is currently three bat laps behind the race, running down at 17th place. So now the game goes to Herta to find out when will he stop and what difference will it make. The problem always for a leader on a mile circuit like the Milwaukee mile is traffic. You no sooner clear it than you're right on top of it again, and that's Dario Franchitti's issue right now, though he runs clear, closing on Jacques Lazier, and Manning, Manning catches the wall. Not entirely unpredictable. You know, that's three cars this weekend, guys, and with the Michigan, <laughs> Michigan race next like week, out. these guys might be running out of cars and parts. Now, they only have one week uh, from today to get ready for the Michigan 400. And like you say, that one tub that uh, Dixon wrote off was written off. I mean, that thing was a mess. These others, uh, that looks, just as it sits there, and lack of an expert eye, looks like that's fairly repairable, but it still means a lot of work on a week you really don't want to have to work that much. Well, that's where the guys in the team are the young son heroes, Paul, because those guys work for hours, a lot of late nights, probably all-nighters, for these guys getting ready because the truck would have to leave on Wednesday to get up there for Thursday tech inspection. And this is a big break for Brian Herta. Let's not forget that, folks. There it is, the red and white car. Fourth in line. You can see the back end just start to slide around coming out of the turn. The car is definitely loose. When we talk about that, that's when the back end wants to swap ends, and certainly that's what happens. Now he's getting maybe a little bit of dirty air from the cars in front, but not so much. You heard him squeeze the throttle, trying to take advantage of getting some air off those cars in front to get the slipstream down the straight, and certainly did not have the back end stick to the ground. Notice how he took his hands off the wheel as he's going into the wall. You always do that, otherwise you end up with what we call driver's wrist. Elio Castroneves just suddenly pulled off under this caution. He's just beyond the pit exit down on the apron. He was trying to get a push, Elio. Tell him to push it. Try and get the push. Now the pits remain closed. And you can see a lot of that smoke coming out of the air box right there. Just get push it. Yeah, but Scott, you'll part. never get okay. any of the drivers to admit that there was an engine failure. Mostly electrical. Yeah, they'll always say, well, we had an electrical <laughs> failure. I said to Al Unser Sr. one time when he said that his Chevrolet expired due to electrical failure, I said, when did the electrics go out, Al, before or after the rod went through the side of the block? That was in your book. I read that story in your book. Well, almost all of the teams are lined up now, including Brian Herta for a stop. So the assumption would be that they all figure they're within range of the end of the race. Might be a little close. I mean, if they get back out there at 150, that gives them, you know, 75 laps. It could be, uh, could be a little bit tight. But the way the cautions are going right now, I say we might see another one today, so that would give them the break that they would need. Led by Frank Keedy, the field on the way in, Jerry Punch. And they gave Dario the option that you want tires or no tires. He said, yeah, let's put four fresh ones on, although we're really good on used tires. They might be able to make it all the way to lap 225. If so, they are going to be the car to 8.8 .8 seconds down the Todd Harris. 
Sam Horses, if you get more front wing, he's still complaining about a really bad push. He said he's focusing the best he can, but he's been fighting a push, and he says it's getting worse by the go. We'll see if this fixes it. Oh, some contact there between Sharp and Fernandez. You all right, buddy? I can't through. Both drivers going sort of the same piece of real estate. You go from three lanes wide down to one on the exit of pit lane going onto the track. Let's take a look from Scott Sharp's onboard camera. See, he's on the right-hand side trying to go into the left just a little bit. Can sense somebody coming. That was very lucky that the car didn't end up going onto its roof. This is the pit out line. Sam Hornish coming out. Then Dario, then Rice. Here's Tony Kanan. Giafoni. Looking to see when Sharp's going to come through here. And man, we're not going to see it. Who Car. came through right behind him? Yeah, I know. All oh, way. Dan Weldon into the pits. And you can see that there is no phrenic activity. So this is not routine. They're looking at the back of the car right there. So it tells you that uh, possibly just in this area here, it might be a half shaft, an axle that might have gone wrong. Does that uh, right half shaft I look like it's down? Yeah, I would certainly say so. You see in that area right there, something's gone on. And uh, it's the upper arm, and then you can see actually the drive shaft going just through here. So, you know, it looks all solid, but we just don't know what's at the ends, Paul. So in a game of pit strategy in this 225-mile race, they bring Darren Manning's car back to the pits, the third broken car of the weekend for Target Chip Ganassi Racing. And Sam Hornish is listed as the leader. We'll be back after this message and a word from our ABC stations. million dollars on the line and one man will decide who gets it all impress a billionaire and you go home a millionaire the benefactor coming this fall to ABC and we're still under the caution Sam Hornish is the leader of the race under caution followed by Frank Keaty and rise and what has been a fascinating afternoon in the IRL's first appearance on the Milwaukee Mile at the start Vitor Mira was the pole sitter but on that very first lap, it was Tony Kanan that jumped into the lead. And then on lap 16, Sam Hornish came up to challenge Kanan, and Hornish took the lead. And then on the 39th lap, Scott Sharp got in trouble. Fortunately, he didn't touch anything and continues to race now. And then there was this problem with Townsend Bell. Then Elio Castroneves. And finally, Dario Franchitti dropping to the inside to pick the lead up. And then Darren Manning just a few moments ago coming off at turn two and into the wall. Todd Harris. Well, Paul, I'm here with Darren Manning. The good news is he's okay. Darren, take us through what happened there. Yeah, I don't know really. I mean, the car was working fantastically. I just went into uh, one and two, really, really steady because there's a couple of cars up in front of me. Got into the middle, and the car just spun out on me. It just, just snapped sideways like massively. I, I wasn't uh, thinking about it. You know, I was pushing all the way, all the way through the race. There was no hint of oversteer, and then uh, it just, you know, the steering wheel was at 40. The car was at 45 degrees before I knew anything about it. So uh, I don't know if something broke or, or what, but uh, just a shame for the. Uh, Target Chip Ganassi racing. I've had a tough weekend. You know, I was being patient all the way through the race. I was obviously faster than quite a lot of the other guys out there, but uh, you know, was able to pass and just just a shame to finish this way. We're glad you're okay. We'll see you in Michigan. Let's sit over Jerry Punch. The guys, and Danny Weldon has climbed out of his uh, Jim Beam Klein Tools machine, has talked to crew members Tony Cotman and others. And Danny, you came from the back of the pack to the top ten like a rocket, and now you're out of it. What happened? I think we just lost, lost the half shaft, but you know, the Klein Tools Jim Beam car was good. It was disappointing to qualify so bad, but uh, you know, I just hope Dario can win. He looks very strong. All right, Danny Walden, second in the points, having an exit here about to pass the half one. Yeah, but if you saw on that points chart with Weldon out of the race, uh, that's going to give Rice an advantage in that battle. Obviously, we are back to green flag racing. It's Sam Hornish 
trying to catch Dario Franchitti. 158 laps in this race right now. Elio Castroneves did get the car restarted. In fact, almost immediately and is running. He is at the end of the lead lap in 10th position. And as we saw, it's Sam Hornish Jr. right there. This is a bit of a home race for him. His mom, Joe Ellen, is from Milwaukee, was born here. And his mom and dad's first date, well, it was at the Milwaukee Mile. Is mom like mom and dad? Yes. In the United States, States Canadian with mom and dad. You know, we talk about the restarts here in the IRL. You just got to love restarts. But, boy, if you have a lousy car like Scott Goodyear has, you become okay. the meat in a high-speed sandwich. I mean, you can like, hand that, hang that on Goodyear. Yeah, I'm, 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 Scott Sharp. I'm right beside you, buddy, up here. Yeah. I'm with you. <laughs> like Scott Sharp, he's just having a terrible weekend. Becomes the meat in a sandwich there. And, you know, that's when you just hope that the race ends at 200 laps rather than 225. Mornings with Buddy Rice working on him. You're going to get back next week, I'm sure, because uh, we're going to Michigan, which is one terrific race where you have been quite successful, Mr. Goodyear. Great racetrack up there, like I was mentioning earlier. It's fast. All the drivers love it, but no room for error up there, guys. Looking back from Townsend Bell, that's Mira, the pole sitter, and someone from whom we've expected more today. I wonder what's going on there. Well, he said he was pleased with his car, but it wasn't as strong as his teammates, Thomas Schechter, who unfortunately had that gearbox problem that fell out. But right now, I think that those guys have the mindset they just want to finish. Remember last week, he did a great race, finished fifth, and he's in fifth right now. So Panther just needs to have some finishes underneath their belt. They've not had a very good year so day. And what about Mira? Here he turns a blistering pace to take the pole and drops back almost immediately. Mira himself who spoke to him, and he didn't seem as confident as he did last week. And I'd have to say that he knew that maybe it wasn't exactly what he wanted. And so then he has to go out there and just see what he has. And I didn't think he has the car today to do it. Bell and Mira. Chevrolet and Honda battled for fifth. Interesting to say when you talk about Honda and Toyota and Chevrolet, Toyota cars are so fast, like Chip Ganassi's and Scott Dixon's, especially when they unloaded off the trailer here for Friday. That horsepower advantage that Honda seems to have enjoyed so far this year has been gone. The handling has been more of a preface for all the cars here. But next week will be very interesting. The high speed we talked about, Michigan International Speedway, 215, 20 miles an hour average all day long. When you watch these cars, guys, you see them bouncing around a little bit. It is a rough racetrack. It's a short racetrack. It's at a fairgrounds. But you talk to every driver, Scott, and they all say, boy, we sure love running this place. I said, well, why compared to a place like Richmond? They said, because this place has got some straightaways and long, sweeping corners. They said, we really enjoy the ambiance and also the racetrack. Dario Franchitti enjoying it very well in the Arca X blue and white car. But they said, we might change our opinion if we had to do it every weekend. Yeah. Uh Franchitti has now moved. They just told him he was three seconds ahead. He's really two and a half seconds ahead of Sam Hornish, but who's counting the tenth? Sherry Punch? And the reason that's happened, Paul, is you just saw a moment ago, Kyle Moyer, the team manager, along with Michael Andretti, they have told, as you look at Michael on the right side of your screen, they have told Dario Franchitti, you are burning too much fuel. We have to be very careful. We can make it home, and we're all celebrating victory lane if, and the big if is, you can save a little more fuel. That time by, a moment ago, Kyle Moyer said, that's more like it, back the pace down. And now Dario has to keep this pace in order to make it all the way to the checkered flag. 168 laps, 225 the distance. We're going to have another caution before the end of this race, I predict it. You predict that? Yeah. Actually, the teams, I think you showed it to us a couple of weeks ago, Jack, keep charge trying to figure out uh, when at least be able to predict with some uncertainty when the uh, pit stop uh, can occur under yellow. Now we said that Scott Sharp was having a bad day. This guy here in the Red Bull number 51, Alex Barron, having a re remarkably good day. This is a team that's had more than their share of problems this year. And I know Alex Barron, for one, is really looking forward to Michigan next week because he did that semi spin and win last year to take the victory. Incredible that any time you spin that track like Michigan, you can continue on, let alone win. Uh, your lucky day. Somebody was saying it was your day. You know, it seems that spinning and not touching anything uh, has become almost a mark of the IRL driver. I mean, they're really skillful at getting the car stopped 
and keeping it going. We saw Scott Sharp do that today. Barron is the second Chevrolet driver in the row right now because Bell is in fifth. Barron is now seventh. Dario Franchitti with the target fastest lap in the race. The only car over 160 miles an hour at 160.2. We said how Dario Franchitti has his actress wife Ashley Judd here. Well, it's Jennifer Lopez's birthday today, so I asked all the drivers, J-Lo or Brittany, and I'm hoping that Ashley isn't listening because very quickly, her husband said, oh, Brittany, without question. Oh, nice work, Dario. Yeah, nice, nice work. Talking about those charts and possible projections, uh, looking at the one that Andretti Green Racing put together before the weekend started, and using data, of course, not from the IRL. Look how fast he closes. Using... Um, uh, Using data that came out of the card series, there's about a 40% probability, not just of one, but of two yellows before outside, the end of the race. Clear. One of those probabilities comes up at about the 190th lap, and then again about the 212th lap. The other thing we should keep in, keep in mind, fellas, is that all of the teams monitor each other's radio. So if all of a sudden Dario Franchitti, we heard him say, go to five, go to fuel mapping five, if they're trying to conserve fuel, you know that Marlboro Team Penske has told Sam Hornish Jr. precisely that. And we'll have to watch the race pace to see how it adjusts. Is he going to try and chase down the leader, or is Hornish going to be content running in second for a while? Well, one of the advantages of the Toyota engine seems to be that it's getting a little better economy and in front of this great crowd here today on a beautiful day. Temperatures are perfect, skies are blue. We'll see how it plays out. Who is able to calculate fuel the best? Tuesdays this fall on ABC, Rodney's an everyday guy running down his dreams. Luckily for him, his family's willing to go along for the ride. Rodney Carotine is Rodney, a new comedy. Tuesdays this fall on ABC. On the Milwaukee Mile, getting close to the finish now, and the radio has been alive with traffic talking to everyone in the top 10 about fuel conservation. Now this guy, had an interesting moment just a second ago. This is Townsend Bell. That's about as close as you can come and not actually hit it. That could have been the caution that everybody else was hoping for. And the reason they're hoping is that the call on the fuel load currently in the car is going to be very, very close. Some say maybe to 122 or 222, maybe to 225, which is the checkered flag. Got to give a lot of credit to Townsend Bell coming in and replacing Mark Taylor in this Menards Panther racing team. He's had, he's doing a good job, saving fuel. He's done a great job. And, and I was going to say, not only saving fuel, he's been doing a great job with this car. Certainly, they're performing better. And, uh, you know, he's had more than his share of problems with a fire bottle going off, almost hitting a track worker, now almost hitting the wall. This is a guy that just, he's like Mr. Magoo. It all seems to happen behind him. <laughs> Well, interesting to see you watch his race pace now, and he's actually slowed off the pace about four miles an hour from where he was previously and allowing Mira to get by him. So I'm just wondering if they're sort of calculating with the Chevrolet power plant that they might be able to go all the way, hoping that everybody else in front, either in a Honda or a Toyota, might have to pit. Well, what have we learned in the past? I think in the past races, especially on the short tracks, we always thought that Honda had the best fuel consumption and we actually got the most out of it. That would favor your leader, Dario Franchitti. Sam Hornish with the Toyota, Buddy Rice with the Honda. So maybe you're right. Maybe Chevrolet's done something. I know they've been messing with their fuel mapping over the last couple of races. Maybe if it does become a fuel conservation effort, it could favor the boat type of age. Well, both Toyota and Chevrolet have been playing with software and hardware. So most of them are really looking more forward to what they can do for the high speeds of Michigan, but fuel economy and how long you can make each stint is really part of the game here and played very well by these teams. Jerry Punch. 
And Paul, a lot of these teams are just trying to calculate their fuel to make it to lap 225 in the checkered flag, but not so in the Buddy Rice camp. Here's what they want to do. They want to conserve extra fuel right now. They've calculated what they need to conserve in the next uh, 20 or 25 laps. So with about seven or eight laps to go, they can go full fuel and come and try to run those guys down that are trying to temper their fuel mileage in the last four or five. Save extra now and then light the fires with about eight laps to go. Wow, they think they can do that. Paul, let's not forget, I told you at the top of the show, this is a team that mixes. Mixes, I can't get no respect with let's take no prisoners. They're willing to not only think outside the box, they're not afraid to blow the box up. Frankiti, Hornish Jr., and Rice. There goes Hornish. Rice come into your view there at the bottom. Frankiti is 2.7 seconds ahead of Sam Hornish, and Elio Castroneves is now 75 laps since his last stop, and the Penske team puts him on the pit road. Todd Harris. Well, fellas, they said they were going to try to go as far as they can. The hope for the Castro Nevis camp was going to be there was a yellow flag that was going to come out. They thought Townsend Bell might have provided it when he came up on that wall and didn't touch it. They're just giving him four tires, pop his fuel off, and they're going to hope for the very best. And meanwhile, Townsend Bell's people tell me he is done coming in. They are going to make a run for it. No more fuel stop for Townsend Bell. That's what it looked like. That's what we thought. You know, one of the big owners is here this weekend, Jim Harbaugh. Used to be the quarterback for the Indianapolis Colts and then the San Diego Chargers and now is the head football coach for the University of San Diego. So he hasn't been in a racetrack for quite some time. If they win, I suspect he might be showing up a lot more just for good luck. <laughs> Frank has been 45 laps since he last stopped. That's true of everybody in the top 10 now. Remember Dario Franchitti was injured his back so severely last season, sat out most of the year, had an opportunity. They said, look, you can either go through some very, very experimental and touchy back surgery, which will put you back in the put you back in the cockpit of the car, or you could stop driving. And he decided that he was going to take the chance he surgery for one reason. He said the only reason he wants to do it is because he wanted to get back in the cockpit, not to drive, to win. Maybe today will culminate that chase and make all that back surgery worthwhile. And Jack, there was never any question when I talked to his wife, Ashley, and Dario during one of the delays in Indianapolis. Ashley spoke up before Dario could answer. said he never even hesitated. He said, when you said you can race, it's going to be risky, but you can race if we fix this back. Otherwise, you have to walk away. He said, no question. Fix my back. I want to win, and I want to win again soon. And that's the man, the 27 car, the ARCA-X machine out of Andretti Green Racing, Dario Franchitti. Currently in the lead here, 196 laps are now complete. They're working 197. They're scheduled 225. And the question is, Rice and Townsend Bell, they say they're going all the way. But can they? And can the rest of the field? We'll be back. Back on the Milwaukee Mile, who's going to join this list of former winners here today? Dario Franchitti is still at front, followed by Rice, Hornet, Canaan, Maribel. They're all closing in, and it's become the waiting game now. How far can I carry the car? Am I going to be able to get it the next 22 laps to the finish of this race, or will I run it out of fuel and have to get into the pits before the end of the race? The pace. Obviously, because they're being very careful, has slowed. And they're running laps uh, right now at about 149 for the leader. But Franchitti ran that in traffic. Rice was faster last time around, but I'm sure he didn't want to be all that fast. Well, one guy that slowed down a fair amount in his last little while, Paul's Castro Nevis, who every time he goes past the front straightaway here, his engine is off song. He's now down two laps, and he's probably just trying to run that thing to the end as gingerly as possible just so we can get some points for the championship. The uh, Marlboro team, Penske team, for reporting that up as electronics. There's Elio. And they just want to gather whatever points they can at this point. This was the team that we all thought was going to be the New York Yankees with Elio Castroneves joining with Sam Hornish Jr., a two-time IRL champion for 2004. What they didn't count on, though, was Andretti Green Racing, which I think arguably you could say not the Boston Red Sox, but maybe the Oakland Athletics or maybe one of those teams. But I asked 
I, I also asked Buddy Rice's team manager, Scott Remke, who they were in terms of a baseball analogy. So without question, we're the St. Louis Cardinals. Nobody gave us a chance. And look who's leading the division right now. Jerry? Well, and Jack, I, just spoke, I just spoke to Scott Remke a moment ago. And remember, they were talking about the possibility of trying to save enough fuel to be able to race the five or six laps. Scott said they have not been able to do what they had hoped to do. They have told Buddy Rice, you will have enough to make it, but barely. You will not have enough if we try to pump them these last four or five laps and get real racy. So watch Buddy Rice. If he goes after him with five to go, he may not make it. Well, the interval is three seconds right now. The question, of course, remains Frank Keaty. Does he have enough fuel on board that car to make it all the way to the end? Do you remember in St. Louis a couple of years ago when Rick Gallus was still fielding a car with Al Unser Jr. Oh, as the driver? I. They kept telling Al Unser on the radio, hey, don't worry about it. We got plenty of fuel. We got plenty of fuel. Then there was a late race caution. They brought him in, and he said, well, we planned on that caution. That's changed. We haven't heard any radio conversations like that today. Everybody that's driving these cars, Scott Goodyear, know what the fuel situation is. Nobody's lying to these drivers. Well, that information's right on that telemetry desk that you have in front of you. All the drivers know that. They basically know how much fuel is in the tank and how much is left, basically, from that computer readout. And I'll tell you right now, you can figure it out by yourself going around here. <laughs> so they're gingerly putting their foot on the gas, just trying to softly pedal the car, as I mentioned, to try and save fuel. You know how that feels? Have you ever tried, been 15 miles away from the ne next oh, gas yeah. station? And the <laughs> Can I make been it on? to that next exit? Exactly. <laughs> and the reserve light is on. Except there isn't $100,000 oh, on the line. Oh, we get the caution? We do get a caution. Car against the wall off of two. It looks to be Jacques Lazier. And it is. So that is the caution, though, that everybody else wanted. Jacques Lazier moves around. Copy that. I'm okay. And he says I he's just okay. I turn in the corner, get a real quick snap on me. Corrected it, I was in the marbles. You heard the report. Yeah, we don't need your analysis now. He told you everything. <laughs> you know, unfortunately, I'm feeling it because I've lived it before. So it just, you're a passenger. It's just absolutely no fun. Yeah, but here's the problem now. If you're one of the crew members over the wall for any of these oh. front runners, you want to talk about butterflies that are going to become bullets. And we've seen mis pit miscues the last couple of races. This choreographed ballet had better be perfect. It's pressure time on pit road. Is anybody out here looking at that car, though, wondering how long will that cleanup take? And will I just keep my car out and run the chance? Well, that's why you have spotters up topside, Scott. Well, I got to tell you right now, if I was in the front group and you thought you just might make it and this yellow comes out, I'm staying out, fellas. I'm not out. coming in. I would definitely leave him out. We'll see who makes that decision. So far, only one team. There are the spotters up top. You can bet there's a lot of information going from there down into the pit area. Only one car has laid out for a pit stop. And that's the uh, Delphi car of Scott Sharp. Yeah, but you don't want to show your hand yet. No. In fact, when you look, there's there's Ashley. Dario's dad. George Franchitti, his dad. Now you look up and down the pit road, though, Jack and Scott. I mean, there are a lot of teams sitting casually with their uh, backs to the track. Uh, that's all a pretense, though, isn't it, Jerry Punch? Exactly, and uh, they do not want to see that yellow come out here in Dario Franchitti's pit. Dario could make it on fuel without the yellow. Now he'll have plenty of fuel, and uh, they have opted not to pit. Now what this really does, though, is help Buddy Rice, the guy who is chasing Dario Franchitti. Buddy Rice will now have enough fuel to do what he wants to do when the green comes back out, which means Franchitti could be a little bit in trouble because uh, Rice, both of the cars, really coming to him. So this really helps Buddy Rice and hurts Dario Franchitti, who could make it anyway to the checkered flag. Let me take you back, fellas, to the Indianapolis 500. Do you remember a restart when Buddy Rice was about third in line? They dropped the green flag. He came up through the gearbox. I think the signal pits, there's guys that are still scared because he went so far down close yeah. to the signal pits that he actually, it was a brush back for one of the signal guys. And he made a pass that eventually paid off with the win for the Indianapolis 500. We're going to see the same thing here in a mile. Very difficult to actually get past the car in front. It's easy to catch up, but very difficult to pass. Now, don't forget, Dario Franchitti has the option of really choosing his line going into the turn. It's going to be one lap car between Dario Franchitti and Buddy Rice on the restart. Well, here's the indicator right now. They've just gone down the front stretch with the pits open into the pits. 
comes A.J. Foyt the fourth with a borrowed nose wing and Scott Sharp. We're going to have another close finish, fellas? Oh, I think so, maybe. Depends on your definition. Well, you know, because we've become accustomed that if it's more than a second, you know, it's like, oh, wow, that wasn't very good, was it? Now, the guy that we have to also think about in this restart format is Hornish. We know how fast he is and how good he is on restarts. He's in third, Toyota powered. Will he be able to get anything done in the few laps that we're going to have remaining? Right now, 10 laps to go. The front of the field is all right together because of this caution. They all have plenty of fuel, or logically so, and they've turned it into a very short sprint race. You know who's the most popular driver out on the racetrack right now? Adrian Fernandez, a lap down, Sanders between first and second. There's the green and red car there, right between Dario Franchitti and Buddy Rice. I guarantee you right now, Buddy Rice's crew is lobbying hard for Adrian Fernandez to pull out of the way and give Rice a shot. Let's go down a pit side to Jerry Punch. Thank you, Jack. Michael Andretti, it's, uh, again, it's Ray Hall Letterman and Andretti Green Racing. Can your guy hold him off? Dario's been awfully stout today. He's been doing a great job. The whole Arca X side of the team's done a great job. Uh, I feel good that we have one car between us for the restart. And, uh, you know, Dario seems to have the speed, so hopefully it will be all right. Uh, you know, we were running lean there to save fuel. Now we don't have to, so we can just go for it. So Dario's the guy. He'll do it. And he's awfully hungry. He's very hungry. He wants this bad. Dario Franchitti wants his victory. He has 10 open wheel wins, only one, though, at an oval track at coming at Rockingham, England in 2002. And his wife told me a moment ago, Ashley, he's overdue. She believes he will get this one here today. I'm thinking that there's a lot of talk going on within the Honda contingent, Fernandez being one of them. It would probably be to the advantage of the Hondas if he would let Rice around because the next two cars in the line are the two Penske cars. The one doesn't matter because it's Elio and he's well off the pace. But the one that does is Sam Hornish. And if he could keep Hornish busy for just a few laps, it might help ensure one two finish for Honda. So in other words, it's in other words, it's let's make a deal and there's no Monty Hall. Exactly. Maybe you can run down there, Jack. Well, guys, I just heard Buddy Rice's new best friend is going to be Adrian Fernandez. The folks at Fernandez camp say they will pull off on the restart and let Buddy Rice have a shot at it. Well, that makes good sense. And that'll come next time around as Dario Franchitti now takes control of the field. The Chevrolet pace truck is off. We mentioned it starting the two teams, Ray Hall Letterman and Andretti Green Racing, and that's what this battle has come down to. You're already seeing it form up, guys. Fernandez is on the low side of the racetrack, leaving the high line to Buddy Rice. Well, Fernandez will try to move to the side and keep away. He does. Buddy Rice comes around, and the leaders are together. Fernandez keeps down and lets Hornish come through. So first, second, and third are right together. But that was a great restart for Franchitti. Dario flashes across the line with five to go now at a half second interval. Great speed that first restart lap over 153 miles an hour. Pretty impressive when you take the green flag. And there you can see just how much separation and just the, the, the time between the restart and now that these two Honda cars have gotten on Sam Hornish Jr. This is going to be a Honda shootout, guys. Oh, yeah, they're just pulling away. Last time across the line, it was 1.7 seconds. Now it's two and a half seconds from the leader, Franchitti, back to third place, Hornish. But the finish is not yet decided. And Buddy Rice may have something to say about it. Said it before, I'll say it again. If Buddy Rice can close, he doesn't. He's not afraid to take no prisoners and put his nose where others might fear to tread. Dario Franchitti sees an awful lot of that Argent Mortgage car in his mirrors right now. Well, you only have to go back a week to the uh, race at, at Nashville to see when he just charged down the inside of Weldon. He had the power, he had the tenacity, and he went for it. Across the line again, it's still Dario. Rice just a little faster that last time around, about 0.3 of a mile an hour, but 
Guys, the time is starting to run out right now. You've got to be within smelling distance if you're going to take a shot at it. And right now, Rice does not look like he's got the legs to do it. And the interval remains about the same last time around. White flag for the final mile comes out. Dario Franchitti acknowledges Rice is stuck at about six-tenths of a second back. Coming off of two, he tries to close. Franchitti leads him into three. Final two corners for Franchitti. Rice can't get closed down on Franchitti. Dario Franchitti is looking at a checkered flag, and Andretti Green Racing has done it again. Dario Franchitti has won at Milwaukee. His, his first career win in the IRL, and Buddy Rice pulls up alongside, gives Dario a wave. That has got to be one very happy man as he takes the sixth win this season for Andretti Green Racing. Dario Franchitti. Right now, this quiet time is private time for your emotions because right now you're waiting for this and when you have that checkered flag, it's almost a little bit of disbelief when you've been waiting for such a long time and going through what he has gone through. I can tell you right now, the emotions are going inside the cockpit for Dario. You certainly had to wonder uh, if you were Dario. Look at the crowd there. They're excited about it. Well, Michael Andretti surely is excited and uh, we're probably going to see a little display of driving prowess here now. Tony Kanan did donuts a week ago at uh, Nashville. Yeah they loved it. <laughs> I wanted more smoke personally. Yeah the kid <laughs> did he just run the thing totally out of fuel though. Oh look at this. Yeah. That's nice. Well, Ashley Judd said he wanted it badly. He proved it. Todd Harris. Well, guys, a very happy Ashley Judd. First of all, your husband finished safely, but you said he wanted this one very badly. He did. I mean, the team gave him an awesome car. He was really quick on used tires. And my favorite part of the race was when Kyle Moyer was on the radio saying, you're going too fast. You're going too fast. He really deserves it. I mean, especially after what happened in Kansas with him starting last, they had to change the engine, raced up to fourth, and a bunch of back markers going to across kept him from competing for the podium. So this one's that much more satisfying because the back markers behaved. Those back markers will get you every time. <laughs> Let's talk about what he's been through, though, with the surgery. And there was thought yeah. that, hey, do we take the chance there? This is got to make it worthwhile. Well, I hope that Dr. Trammell is watching somewhere because he got me on the phone and advised me that that's what Dario should do. And eventually he came to that decision on his own. And it's wonderful for him to win after making that choice because it was a tough one for him. You talk about your husband, the driver of the car. What about Andretti Green Racing? Is this just the four-headed monster or what? It's pretty great, isn't it? Michael knows what he's doing. And he's having such a wonderful time because he doesn't have the pressure of driving. And we've all been talking so much about how we have seen that man smile more in one weekend than we've seen him in the whole time that we, we knew him while he was racing. Well, Ashley, thank you for your time. Go enjoy it with your husband. Thank you. And Dan Weldon gives his congratulations. You saw Tony Kanan jump up there. Is this a team? That kind of spirit is what is driving, in part, Andretti Gree Racing so far forward. Now his dad comes for his duty. Pick up the helmet. The helmet. Unofficial result. Frankini Rice Hornage. We'll be talk back to talk with the participants right after this. And the celebration is ongoing here in Victory Lane as the A.J. Ford Indy 225 at the Milwaukee Mile is history, and Dario Franchitti has done it. And Dario, congratulations. Uh, it's been a long time coming, but I know this means a lot to you. This means a lot, especially such a special track as the Milwaukee Mile. You know, we, we had the cars to do the job today, um, and it just felt brilliant. You know, to come back, having, having a year out to, to win this race, you know, a lot of people to thank, too many to thank on air, but it, uh, yeah, this is pretty special. You had a yellow with 20 laps to go. Were you concerned? I know you could make it on fuel, but now that gave some fuel to Rice and those guys to run you down. Did you think you're going to have to hold him off in the final laps? I thought it was going to come down to handling more than fuel. Uh, I was definitely concerned, but he's been really quick all year. And um, he, was, I was, he was certainly more of a concern than any of the other cars out there, um, particularly you know, Hornish. I, I wasn't too worried about him, but uh, it worked out well. Almost a year ago, you had to make a very difficult decision, you and wife Ashley, about a, a very uh, risky surgery, whether you walk away or come back. 
Did you make the right choice? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And if Dr. Trammell's watching, thanks. You did a good job. Hey, congratulations on a great win here. Go celebrate. Yeah, thank you. Dario Franchitti in victory lane, the sixth win of nine races for Andretti Green Racing. Let's check in with Todd Harris. All right, th thanks, Doc Punch. Here with uh, Buddy Rice. Buddy, you didn't win the battle, but the, the war is still on. You moved to second in points overall, and that's got to be very important to you. Yeah, I mean, the whole key is here to, to make sure we gain points and keep marching forward. Now we're second in points, and uh, excellent finish here for our team. We've uh, struggled every once in a while in the short ovals, and now we got a handle on it. We know how to make it run last on the long runs, and uh, we're going to keep going. We're looking forward to Michigan right now and the rest of the season. On that restart, Dario Franchitti just told Dr. Jerry Punch that you were the guy he was most worried about. He got a great restart. Did you feel like in those six laps you had a shot at getting him? We both struggled down in one and two, and we're both very good in three and four. If we would have flip-flopped, there might have been something there, but we were identical on that. And, uh, you know, he had a good day all day, and we just, you know, kept staying right there. We just needed to stay green the whole rest of the way. Um, regardless of the fact, I guess, that he ran out of gas or whatever, they did, you know, their strategy worked out. Just, if we would have stayed green, I think we'd, we would have caught him and maybe had a little bit of advantage when the tires were all hot. But that's the way it goes. They did a good job, and uh, we're happy with where we're at. Scott Gingier talked about the Milwaukee Mile being the great equalizer. It really kind of equalized the horsepower of everyone and made it even. It was a driver's course today. Would you agree? Yeah, definitely. And, and the teams that had the best setups ran up front, and, and we were fortunate enough to have one of those cars. And uh, like I said, this is great for the championship. This is what we're here for. We're bringing that thing here. Buddy, congratulations. We'll see you in Michigan. Thank you. Paul, back up to you. Well, he's right about that. Makes for a very close fight. Dario Franchitti, when he is done with all of his celebrating and ceremony, you'll be able to chat with him. Up just a few minutes after this uh, broadcast goes off the air, log on to ESPN.com, keyword motorsports. And here's the points fight as it stands now. Well, uh, Buddy Rice did on the track what words uh, did not do earlier. He got around Dan Weldon for second place. Tony Kanan still maintains uh, a healthy lead. But as they go to the end of the season last year, about this point, Tony Kanan was in the same place, and it ended up Scott Dixon took home the championship when it was over. So for Dario Franchitti, it's a victory and obviously a very happy team at the Milwaukee Mile. We'll be back with more. Well, the Milwaukee Mile gives Dario Franchitti his first win in the IndyCar series. Coming up tonight on ABC, America's Funniest Home Videos, then Extreme Makeover, the home edition, and the day. Active evening tonight. Right now, though, it's celebration. And the celebration centers around Andretti Green Racing. Here's Jerry Punch. Thank you, Paul. Michael Andretti was a five-time winner here at Milwaukee as a driver. And now, Michael, your first win as an owner. This place has been awfully good to you. I love Milwaukee. It's a great place. And uh, it's nice to see that uh, the team's picking up with the luck that I had here. But, uh, you know, Dario drove an awesome race today. And the whole Arca X team did a tremendous job actually all weekend. And, and I'm really happy for Tony to get some good points there for the championship in the Team 7-11 car and, and Honda to keep their streak going of uh, wins. So uh, it was a big weekend for us. You and Kim Green and Kevin Savory, I mean, everyone knew this team would be formidable. I don't think even you would believe this team would be this dominant, six wins in nine starts. Not really, you know, it's just amazing. It's been a dream year for us as a team, you know, but, you know, it's not by accident. We have a lot of good people on this team. We're, we're all working together as one unit, and, uh, you know, we're getting the results. And, you know, we have three different guys in victory lane, so that, that says something about the whole team as a, you know, an in, entirety. The scorecard stands with Kanan with three wins. And the Weldon with two, and now Franchitti with one, and at least one guy left to win as we head to Michigan. And he's coming. He's going to run strong in Michigan, too. I think he's going to be a real factor. He, Brian's going to win a race before the end of the year, I'm sure. You know, he's a, he's a hard charger, good driver, and he contributes a lot to his team, and he deserves one. So hopefully soon. Speaking of hard chargers, how about the move that Franchitti made to take the lead here? I mean, uh, with, with Hornish. I mean, this guy really obviously wanted it in a bad way. He wanted this one so bad, I can't tell you. You know, he's been so close all year. People don't realize how close he's been to winning a few races, but he just had bad luck. And, uh, you know, he, he, he wanted this bad, and, and he went out and he took it. We talked about the rivalry, and there's a lot of respect between the two teams here, but we talked about Andretti Green versus Ray Hall Letterman, and once again today it came down to two, two cars from two different teams battling in the final laps. Well, they're tough, you know, but we're tough too as a team, and, uh, you know, it's going to be a fight all the way to the end, I can assure you. It's going to be exciting. It should be exciting. Congratulations, Michael. Go celebrate with Dario. All right, thanks. Michael Andretti's first win as an owner here at Milwaukee. Todd?
All right, here with Sam Hornish Jr. Sam, I know it's not where you wanted to be second last week, third this week. Uh, we're halfway through the season. Is this where you thought you might be? Um, you know, obviously, I think we should be about 60 points ahead of where we are. We had uh, some real good race cars early on, but didn't get the finishes. And, you know, they don't give you the points if you don't get the finish. So uh, kind of headed in the wrong direction this week. Uh, we were second last week. I thought maybe we'd head the other way, but uh, not, not quite good enough. We were just kind of on a seesaw all day long as far as uh, getting the car set up, whether it was a little bit of push or a little bit loose, and uh, just couldn't hit the nail right on the head, I guess, and I'm just, you know, really lucky that, you know, I got a good team. The guys uh, did an awesome job for me in the pits. Every time we stopped, we picked up at least one, one, you know, one spot, so these guys have been working so hard at their pit stops, I'm glad it's paying off for them. Your pits were absolutely fabulous. You guys were speeding in and out. It made a big difference. As you look forward to Michigan now, is that where you turn the corner? Is that a track where you feel pretty confident? You know, you just got to wait till the last two laps of those races. Position yourself for the end, and, uh, you know, it gets pretty hectic about halfway through because people are racing like it's the last lap. So it's just a lot about getting to the end. Hopefully uh, we'll have everything we need and be able to run up towards the front. Uh, if not, we're just going to, you know, try to conserve fuel, stay out there, stay in the draft, and uh, wait for the last couple laps. As Roger talked to you a little about, as he's scratching his head, wondering what else you guys can do, because it seems like every track you go to, you make the right adjustments, and then you get there, and then some little snafu keeps you from checkered flag. Hey, I mean, uh, you know, we've, we're doing, we're best in class right now. We're just working on being best in show. All right. Congratulations. We'll see you next week. Thanks. Paul, back up to you. Yeah, next week, Sam Hornish and everybody at the Michigan 400 at Michigan Speedway. When we return, we'll take a look at this race just run, the 225 miles that gave Dario Franchitti his first victory in the IRL. It was quite a day on the famous Milwaukee Mile, the world's oldest race track with the IndyCar Series newest winner. On the start, it was Vitor Mira with the pole, but if Tony Kanaan immediately went for the front, took it. In fact, Mira fell back through most of the day. Scott Sharp got himself in trouble, but kept it off the wall. And then on the track, it was Dario Franchitti going around Elio Castro Neves for the lead for the first time. And then Darren Manning caught the wall. Pretty hard coming off of two. He's okay. Tire's a mess. This was the key moment. 156 lap on the restart. Hornish has the lead. Franchitti takes it away, and he keeps it. And that gives him the checkered flag at the 225 mile mark. And a very happy wife and team, Andretti Green Racing has taken the win, followed somewhat predictably by Ray Hall Letterman Racing. Let's go down now as we uh, take a look here at unofficial results. We'll go down to Jerry Puck. And uh, points leader Tony Kanaan manages a fourth place finish. And Tony, sum up your day for us. Long day. Uh, the car was very difficult to drive. We struggle in the morning warm up. And uh, I think I didn't make the right decisions for the race. So. Uh, it was a long day for me, but uh, we we hanging in there and we still finished fourth. And uh, but I'm I'm happy. I'm very happy for that. It's it's it feels like a win. And you move out in the points, unfortunately, at the expense of your teammate Dan Weldon. Yeah, well, that's that's bad for Dan. But uh, you know that's racing. You know he's a good driver. He has everything we have, and uh, he's going to recover pretty quick. I, I'm sure he's going to be up there in Michigan. And I guess it's uh, Brian Hertha's turn in Michigan, like you said, Doctor. And well, you know, you go to Michigan, that's where your first uh, first indie style win came. So you got to be excited about what could happen there next Sunday. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm very excited. I love that place and uh, hopefully we can do well there. Hey, good luck to you next week. Thank you. Tony Kanaan, the points leader, finishes fourth today and heads to a place he loves to race at Michigan International Speedway next Sunday. And does so with still a fairly firm grip on that points lead. Here the unofficial res results. We just want to run the entire field through for you once again. Seven cars on the leader lap with Ed Carpenter in the best finish of his career thus far, coming home in 11th place. But Dario Franchitti, of course, the key. He won the race today. And what was a pretty good race, Scott? You know, it was a lot better than I thought it was in the sense of driver conflict because after coming away last weekend, I thought there was going to be a lot of drivers trying to take their frustrations out on each other. But 
Brian Barnhart touched on that in the meeting this morning. I think all the drivers listen to the chief steward. But Scott, make no mistake about it, it is boiling down to Andretti Green Racing and Newman Haas. And when you take a look at what's happening to some of the other teams we always thought were great, how about Panther Racing not doing too well? It's down, you know, it's down just strictly to those two teams, I think, in the battle for the championship. And I got to be honest with you, I think tempers are going to flare right down to the last race at Texas. Well, it's certainly going to make for a tight fight between those two teams. And I'm, you, you have to feel confident that Target Chip Ganassi and Penske are going to try to get in this fight before the season is over. There is still plenty of time for that. Well, today's 225 mile run on this Milwaukee mile began with a battle of Titan teams. And it ended up that way as well. The points leader, Tony Kanan. Started with Vera, uh, Mira on the pole, but Kanan, as you saw, got around him. Rice and Weldon, they continued their battle. But this time, Weldon had to give way to Rice. Penske team, and they finished up in third and 12. Join ABC Sports a week from today for the Michigan Indy 400 at 3 o'clock noon Pacific. Coming up next, ABC News, World News Tonight, Sunday, or your local news. ABC Sports is online at ESPN.com. Search ABC Sports. This has been a presentation of ABC Sports Championship Television.